so last time we uh, started on our journey of uh, transport through nanostructures, and we first introduced uh, the existence of uh, the four basic energy carriers, uh, and uh, an electron being a subatomic particle carrying a negative charge, a photon being a quantum of field and a basic unit of light. And we talked a bit about this particle wave duality, uh, where experiments with uh, waves and electrons uh, let us understand both the wave properties and the particle properties of matter. And we spoke uh, about the definition of a phonon, which is related to vibrations within an atomic lattice. And we'll see in uh, next time's lecture and the lecture a week from today on mechanical properties and thermal properties that uh, we can learn some uh, basic things by just thinking about the stiffness of bonds uh, within a lattice. And that also relates to heat transport by uh, conduction. And then we also defined an exciton uh, as a so-called quasi-particle, being a state uh, bound between an electron and a hole. And that's what we use to think about uh, excitation of electrons within uh, quantum dots, where we thought about a, a photon coming in, uh, having an energy exceeding the band gap of the structure, exciting an electron to an excited state to, uh, to an unoccupied energy level above the band gap, and then that electron decaying back, and the energy difference of that decay determining the uh, wavelength of the emitted light. And uh, I think last time's lecture was a bit confusing, which is normal. Uh, but a lot of the quantitative things we did with Schrodinger's equation are not so important as the qualitative aspects uh, where I want you to describe why this confinement occurs and how we can develop some you know, intuitions and understanding about the different properties of nanostructures and how they scale with size. And we're doing this because understanding these scaling effects is important to understanding a lot of applications and also understanding important aspects of manufacturing and synthesis as we build our knowledge uh, in the coming weeks. And we broke down the size effects uh, into two general categories. And we had classical size effects. And our definition here is uh, an effect when the mean free path of the carriers or the distance that the carriers travel between collisions, if we have two energy carriers here, uh, the distance that they travel between collisions with one another is our definition for the mean free path. And if that is comparable to the size of our system, for example, the size of our box or the length of our wire, uh, then uh, collisions become with the boundaries become important, and we develop this idea of the effect of the size being important. And the example we illustrated briefly was the thermal conductivity of a thin film uh, changing as the thickness gets lower because the effect of scattering of the lattice vibrations uh, at the boundaries, at the top surface and the bottom surface, whether those be free surfaces or interfaces with other materials, uh, becomes important. And that'll uh, be built upon when we talk about thermal properties next week. And then we kind of jump to the other regime, what we're calling quantum size effects. And this relates to this idea of quantum confinement, where the allowable energy levels, energy states within the solid uh, change. And you know, here I just kind of want to jump from this definition to uh, our idea of a small box in which we use the confinement of the one-dimensional time invariant uh, Schrodinger equation to develop an idea for the separation between those energy levels. And this, we saw this restricts what's called the density of states. Uh, and uh, also, as we'll see today in Aaron's presentation, uh, we'll get an idea of how this changes the band structure or the distribution of allowable energies, which is a really complex topic that we're only seeing the surface of. And we'll also see, for example, uh, how due to not only size but shape of the structures, the properties of the structure can be anisotropic. You can imagine that the properties of a carbon nanotube, which is very long and narrow, are very different along its axis, kind of this one-dimensional thing, than perpendicular to its axis. Whereas, you know, in the case of a quantum dot, we just don't really think about dimensionality. We just think of the, you know, the, the, the photon coming in somewhere and it just generally emitting a photon if you have the, you know, the excitation and the decay process. So these are the two kind of general types of size effects that we want to consider. And we'll see a lot of examples of these going forward. And remember, we went from this, what is a really, you could say, you know, picture book picture for nanosystems, the idea of having a this restricted density of states in a zero dimensional structure to this ideal example of, a, uh, of energy confinement inside this little box being a particle in an infinite potential well and solving uh, the time invariant Schrodinger equation for this one dimensional system of length d, uh, you confirmed our you know, intuition just based on the idea of 
standing waves that you could only have a num you know, an, an integral number of half wavelengths across the space. And then if you related that to the energy of the wave function, you could define the discrete energy levels and the spacings between the energy levels. And I had a bit of a mistake that Peter pointed out in the definition of the wave function. Uh, it, it really is what's called a probability amplitude because it's complex. And then if you formally take the square of the wave function, then you get the probability density, uh, which is uh, the, you know, the probability of finding uh, that uh, as a function of position and time. And you integrate it uh, from negative in infinity to infinity, and you get 1 because uh, you have a density function. And then we closed in talking about this example of the size-dependent color of quantum dots, now a picture we've seen many times. And the practical thing that happens when you excite you know, one of these solutions with, uh, uh, with light, light where the energy exceeds the band gap of the dot, uh, you uh, then get emission or luminescence at a well-defined peak. And uh, in an ideal case, if you assume this perfect model, the emission spectrum would be uh, one straight line, one you know, vertical line, delta function like so. But because of the real processes and because of the distribution and sizes of the structures, you get a peak like this. But anyway, you see, the pace, based on differences in size, you see a difference in the color of uh, emission. And we broke this down into a basic picture where uh, the electron is excited to a higher level and then decays down to uh, its initial level. And we wanted to understand more quantitatively how we uh, establish the wavelength or the energy of that emission process as a function of the size. And here's where we connected our idea of confinement in that simple well to uh, the idea of the band gap and extra energy needed because of the discrete separations of the energy levels. So if you had a bulk material, we'll see from Aaron's talk today, more of the idea of just you know, this development of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a static band gap or a forbidden you know, set of energies uh, in the material itself. And when we get down to the regime of quantum confinement, the fact that the size restricts the allowable energies means that the band gap actually changes, and the band gap is a function of size. So band gap energy can be equal to the light energy uh, of emission. And if, if changing the size of the particle changes that band gap energy, then the light energy changes. And we got down to a quantitative expression for uh, this uh, basic model, which comes out of the Gapanenko kind of extra reading, which you'll probably look at a bit to get some data for the problem set. And we we're able to formalize from solving this, uh, this, this equation in a spherical well, so a one-dimensional well with a radius equal to the radius of the, of the particle, that the uh, relative energies of the allowable levels uh, are equal to the bulk band gap of the material plus this energy which relates to the confinement. And these are the zeros of a Bessel function. This is the diameter. And this mu is an effective mass relating to the masses of electrons and masses of holes in the particular material. And we can see this. I think this is a really beautiful example because it correlates really nicely with experiments, the ability to measure these properties optically to excite different solutions with light and measure their emission spectrum and absorption spectrum, and also to control the synthesis to make different sizes or to make a whole bunch of sizes and then separate them lets us relate the properties to size. So here we have, for example, uh, the absorption spectrum of different solutions of quantum dots. Uh, uh, and this is the intensity of light absor absorption, and this is the wavelength. And you can see that the spectrum varies as the size changes. And as we go from a relatively smaller size, this is about 4 nanometers, to a larger size, this is 5 nanometers, we can see that the uh, energy uh, of, the, uh, of the, 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 this peak here is decreasing. And uh, we're approaching an energy that corresponds to the bulk band gap. So if we looked at, for example, uh, bulk cadmium selenide, which is this material, uh, we, see, we would see the spectrum approaching closer to this position. And because of the utility of these materials for imaging, as we'll see in a minute, uh, for example, you can put chemistry on the surface and you can hook them to other molecules. Do you have a question? OK. Sorry, I thought I saw a hand phantom up in the, in the corner. Uh, uh, you can, the, the people have made uh, different materials in different sizes, 
And this is just a nice plot from a review paper that talks about the field and about quantum dots for imaging that shows that using different materials in different sizes, you can get emission wavelengths over a broad range. So going from the narrow uh, visible wavelength all the way up to uh, into the infrared, uh, uh, you can see that there are tr certain trends with size. And because of the intrinsic properties of the material itself, you see that, for example, cadmium selenide uh, you know, is narrow within this, say, 400 to 450 nanometer range from 3 to 5 nanometers, and then, uh, or, or cadmium sulfide and cadmium selenide uh, at smaller size equals a larger wavelength and so on. And uh, beyond the scope of what we're, the, we're discussing, there are other approaches to, for example, you know, creating core shell structures, which means that you have one material in the center, another material on the outside, and that can also be used to manipulate the effect of states on the surface. Sometimes if you have, say, oxidation of the surface of a particle, that can affect the optical properties because uh, states, because that, you know, that excited state will get trapped at the surface and then it may decay non-radiatively or effectively transferring heat to the lattice rather than emitting light. And as an aside, that's actually a reason why the optical properties of silicon nanoparticles, say you make a 5 nanometer particle of silicon and a 10 nanometer particle of silicon, the, the, the emissions of those will not depend on size because, your, uh, you, because the uh, effect of oxidation of the surface overcomes the size effect. But, you know, kind of back to this plot, this is just a nice normalized plot of the spectra of the uh, emission spectra of uh, these dots of uh, selected materials. Uh, and you can see that these can be engineered to span a wide wavelength. And this directly relates to the manufacturing of them, as we'll see uh, in several lectures. Uh, and I think this may also be from the Alvisados paper that I asked you to read. And uh, here they've just plotted the absorption and emission spectra of a whole bunch of cadmium selenide, selenide quantum dots that are prepared using different synthesis temperatures. So for now, we can just imagine having a, a beaker or a vat with the right chemicals in which the dots grow uh, and uh, that being heated at a certain temperature for a certain time. And by changing the temperature and also changing the ratio of the particular precursors, and by changing the time at which you heat it, uh, you know, they've, they've backed out this beautiful trend uh, in the uh, spectra and uh, in effect in the size and the size distribution of the particles. And we'll see later on how, for example, the size distribution evolves with time and how these conditions will be changed varied time with time to, uh, to uh, create the synthesis. But certainly you can imagine that you're controlling the synthesis process to give, for example, it a, a peak an average size at say 5.4 versus 5.6 could, depending on the material, have a big difference in the color and, for example, a big difference in the imaging if you wanted to, say, coat one size with one receptor and another size with another receptor to get some kind of multicolor uh, image. And that leads to you know, really what one of the biggest applications of these materials has been, and that has been for uh, imaging, particularly for uh, biomedical imaging. Uh, uh, in some, in a lot of cases, this is still at the research stage, uh, and and you know, imaging with fluorescent things is a big technique that's really pushed uh, a biological and biomedical research. And uh, many years ago, and in fact, I think recently, the Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery and and amplification of GFP, which is a an, a green fluorescent pl protein that was, uh, I guess, originally found in jellyfish. Uh, and uh, that after this was discovered, this became used widely in biology uh, for imaging. If you, you could use this protein and you could uh, you know, chemically modify it, and therefore you could, you could use it to, say, label certain tissue, and uh, then you could see what, you know, where that tissue was at a very fine resolution, for example. Uh, and and uh, there's been a lot of work on this, but the ability to now control the properties of these quantum dots gave a lot more flexibility in this idea of having essentially a nanoscale light beacon to image things. And the advantageous properties are, for example, getting very narrow emission peaks, so having very pure colors if you have very pure size. Of course, the ability to uh, change the emission depending on the size to kind of engineer this color. And then another advantage was that while these fluorescent proteins would glow because they're a more you know, natural, a fragile, a biological material, they would do what's called photobleach, which means after they emitted so many photons, they would no longer work. And that was okay for some things, but not as robust for other things. And uh, the, uh, 
for example, if you look at what's called the emission lifetime, uh, where you're, for example, exciting the material so it emits about 100,000 photons per second, uh, a fluorescent protein would, uh, would last for a very short time, whereas a quantum dot, in this case, this is a core shell uh, quantum dot, would last for a much longer time. Uh, and this gave the materials a lot of advantages. And this, for example, is just a picture from this review paper, which shows uh, they were doing some experiments on uh, this mouse here and using uh, a functionalized quantum dots to uh, isolate uh, the location of little of certain tumor cells. And uh, in this case, they injected the quantum dots at the back here, and they flowed through the bloodstream, and they, they attached selectively to the location of this, uh, uh, this diseased tissue. And there are more details about this uh, in the paper. And another advantage was that because you can, uh, you, there's a lot of knowledge of the chemistry of these semiconductor surfaces, uh, you can develop a lot of diverse chemistries for attaching them to different things. And likewise, there are now a lot of interesting studies on how these materials are ingested and expelled by the body. And it's coming out, for example, that there are particular critical sizes beyond which our organs, our bloodstream, and our kidneys will exhaust the, uh, the, these agents. And, and choosing things in that size range is really important for the biological viability of these materials. And you can buy them from a bunch of companies. Uh, you'll look on the web and you can find, you know, for example, if you wanted these, you can get samples of them. They're pretty expensive on, in research quantities. This is a couple years old and they were selling one gram for about $1,500, but one gram goes a long way uh, if you only need to inject a little bit at a small concentration and image a small area. And there are other applications, for example, in uh, solar cells and in light emitting diodes. Uh, you can imagine that uh, you can use them in a photovoltaic device, which we'll see later, uh, if you can engineer the absorption in the optical spectrum to, for example, convert uh, you know, light to electricity, where you don't want the emission again, but you want to capture that excited electron and then run it through a circuit and you know, generate a potential and therefore generate energy. Uh, quantum dots are also being used to create uh, very pure, uh, sort of pure color uh, light emitting devices. And this is a schematic of a device that was published several years ago where you have a stack of different materials. And the basic process that's going on here is you apply a voltage between two electrodes. And you have in between those electrodes uh, uh, and some other uh, layers that guide the transport of electrons and holes. You have a layer of quantum dots, and when you apply a potential, then you are basically converting the uh, electrons that you're applying across those electrodes to an emitted photon and essentially reversing the process of excitation and emission or exciting it externally. And you can find a lot more information on this if, you are, if it's something you're interested in reading about. Okay, so. Uh, that's a bit of a recap of last time. Uh, and today we're going to talk about uh, what governs the electronic properties of nanostructures. So we're going to focus more specifically on electrons as energy carriers. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, the idea of dispersion relations and the statistics of carrier uh, energies and their properties. We'll talk about how that relates to the band structure of a material, how we develop a band gap, and how that differentiates, for example, between uh, metals and semiconductors and insulators. And in essence, from the way the band structure develops, why some materials conduct electricity really well, and other materials don't conduct electricity uh, well at all. And then we'll see a couple of examples. We'll talk about what are known as single electron transistors. And we'll also review some examples of the electrical properties of carbon nanotubes. And the readings online are a section from Professor Gang Chen's book, uh, which relates to the, uh, the uh, energy carrier stuff we're going to talk about, a chapter from the introductory book on uh, nanoelectronics, as well as a journal paper that reviews uh, aspects of carbon-based electronics. So it talks about nanotubes and graphene and molecules. And uh, the specific operation of each device is not important. Rather, I just want it to be a survey of the types of devices that researchers are making with carbon-based nanostructures. And then there are a couple of extra articles that get more to practical issues of integration of nanocrystals and nanotubes into electronic devices. And uh, we'll be grabbing examples from these two papers today and in subsequent lectures when we talk about the device fabrication processes. OK, so now uh, Aaron Schmidt is going to talk for a little while. And he'll uh, talk about uh, dispersion relations and band structure.
you guys hear me? Higher up? Good? Bad? Okay. Yeah, so the purpose of, of this part of the lecture is really just to kind of get you comfortable with some of the, the terminology that people use talking about the properties of materials uh, and what makes them have certain transport properties or band structure, energy levels. And we're going to mostly focus on bulk materials. Uh, but that's important because then you can start to see the limitations. And when you shrink things down, you'll have an understanding of how those change. And the other important thing to get out of this is really just to be familiar with some of the basic ideas. So when you start reading papers, if you see things plotted a certain way or certain quantities, you'll at least have some idea of where they're coming from, even if you don't get all the details. So. OK, so just a quick review of some of the stuff we've talked about before. Uh, the idea of crystals and how a crystal will affect the properties of energy carriers. So the main property of a crystal is that it's periodic. And that means that a lot of the transport properties are determined by the periodicity. So in effect, everything inside the crystal will depend on the spacing between the atoms in some way. And in literature, you'll see for a lot of reasons that things are presented not in terms of the period of the atoms, but in terms of the reciprocal of the period of the atoms. And there's a few reasons for this. Part of it comes from the way we look at crystals using x-ray diffraction. But uh, more generally, the idea is just that uh, because it's periodic, it's very convenient to look at things in like a Fourier transform space. So you may have seen this from other classes. Uh, like imaging, for example, where if you take the Fourier transform, then all the periodic properties uh, show up very nicely. And so you'll see everything plotted usually in terms of 1 over the spacing. Uh, and the last, the last advantage to this is that uh, from quantum mechanics, we saw that 1 over the spacing, or 1 over the wavelength of a particle, is related to its momentum. So in a sense, you're looking at uh, momentum on one axis. And you can generalize this to a three-dimensional crystal. That was a simple 1D chain. But in reality, there's complex crystals with different arrangements of atoms. And for every real space lattice, you can have uh, a reciprocal lattice. So essentially like a 3D Fourier transform of the structure. And it's a little bit complex, but the important feature is that you know, from the center, you have a unit cell in real space and a unit cell in uh, reciprocal space. And there are certain directions inside that are high symmetry directions. So from the center, which is usually called the gamma point uh, over here, and then to this corner, they'll call it the L point, or to one face, it'll be called the X point. And when people plot properties of uh, a material, you'll see it plotted from gamma to X or gamma to L, and this kind of, and that's what they're, they're talking about. And uh, one, one last concept I want to talk about before we get into really what happens is the idea of a dispersion relation. And people will use the term dispersion relation or band structure kind of interchangeably. Uh, roughly speaking, it's just the relationship between energy and momentum of a, of a particle, or equivalently, frequency and wave vector. And the simplest dispersion relation you can think of really is uh, this light in a vacuum where the frequency is related to the wave vector by a constant c, which is the speed of light. Uh, but what happens inside a material is that the relationship becomes more complicated. So the, the speed will start to depend on the frequency, for example. And this is what leads to things like a glass eh, it's okay, uh, affecting the speed of light. And that's what separates out the different frequencies inside a, a crystal. Uh, so that's the principle behind a prism. And in the same principle applies to things like electrons, phonons, photons inside real materials. Uh, OK, so we're going to focus on electrons in periodic systems. But a lot of this stuff more generally applies to, to phonons in a crystal lattice or photons in a structure. You may have heard of a photonic crystal or photonics. And that's the interaction of light with periodic structures that people make. So a lot of these ideas will apply. Uh, and a nice way to start thinking about this is to go back to 
a free electron, so an electron just floating around in space with nothing around. And I think you saw last time that you can write the Schrodinger equation for this electron. And uh, that quantity psi is the wave function, and when you square it, it tells you where you'll find the electron. Now, beyond that, what the psi really means, no one knows. All you know is if you square it, it tells you the chance of getting an electron there. And if you solve that for this free potential, you find uh, this relationship on the bottom, that psi equals an exponential, basically, a, a plane wave. And the relationship between energy and the wave vector is E equals h bar squared k squared over 2m. So it's a parabola. Instead of light, if having a straight line, you get a parabolic dispersion curve for the free electron. And now we can ask, OK, what happens if we take that electron and we put it inside a lattice? So if these positive uh, ions represent like atomic nuclei, there's going to be this kind of periodic potential. And the electron will see all these, and it's got a periodicity. And if we solve the Schrodinger equation for this potential, we'll see how that leads to the development of band structure. So before we do that, just a really kind of cartoon picture of what a conductor is versus what an insulator is. Uh, on the left, you have atomic nuclei, and then the electrons are tightly bound to those nuclei. And so they're more or less localized, and you don't get a lot of free motion. So the electrons aren't free to wander around and carry energy from one place to another. But when the electrons are more loosely bound, there's more of them, they sort of become shared between all the electrons. And in that sense, they're considered free. So that you can almost think of a, a piece of metal with a good conduction as one huge molecule, where a lot of the electrons are kind of spread over the whole thing. And because of that, they can transport electricity or heat very easily. And that's what makes them good conductors. So now we want to understand this picture in a little bit more detail, maybe not too much. Uh, so going back to our picture of electrons in a periodic system, uh, we're going to consider just a simple 1D picture. And we're going to pretend that the electrons don't interact with each other too much. So we can consider an isolated electron. And this approximation works pretty well, actually, most of the time. Uh, so if we start with the picture on the left, we can make a very simple approximation of it with the picture on the right. So instead of this shape, we just have uh, these kind of step functions representing periodicity. And if we write the Schrodinger equation now, that second line, uh, it's the same except that we have this u, the potential energy function. And u takes this simple form of being 0 between 0 and a on the x-axis, and then u0. Uh, between a and a plus b. And we need one more piece of uh, math to solve this, and this is called the Bloch theorem, which comes out of Fourier analysis. And that says basically that if you take the wave function at any location, uh, x, and you multiply it by this exponential factor, uh, e to the i k a plus b, it should be the same as the wave function at uh, one lattice vector over. So basically, it comes out of the periodic nature of the lattice. And you can relate what you have at one point to another by this theorem. And so you apply these conditions to this equation, and you get out the acceptable solutions. So like before, where we had, uh, what's the deal with this thing? Do you have another pointer? Yeah. Thanks. OK, yeah, so as before we had this uh, parabolic dispersion, now under these new conditions, we're going to get a different dispersion. And what you have here is the solution. I'm not going to show you how to do it, but it's in uh, Gong Chen's book, and you can go through the, the solution. Uh, but here is a, the parabola. So this is the dispersion of the free electron. So if we let those uh, potentials go to 0, you'll recover this, this shape. So it's just the parabolic dispersion. And then once you start to put in these gaps, uh, you get uh, distinct regions opening up where there is no solution. And so you have electrons allowed to be here at this energy, and then they'll jump up to here with nothing in between. And you keep going up, and there's these gaps. And the gaps are related to how high that potential is, for example. And you'll notice that 
because of the, the periodic nature of this, uh, you can take this diagram and represent it all just by folding it into one unit cell. So this is called the extended zone representation. And then when you really see in, in papers, for example, this is called the reduced zone representation. And so this would be one, one energy band, and then another, and then another, and then another. And the dashed line shows the parabola, so if that were folded in on itself. So you can see how the free electron, there are no bands. Everything's continuous going up. But once you impose this periodic potential, you get gaps. And so that's, that's kind of a rough idea of what's happening. And you'll see the same thing for phonons, for example. So you'll get gaps in the allowable vibration modes in uh, a crystal as well. Okay. And so that was a pretty simple picture, just a 1D chain. Uh, and you can imagine in a real 3D crystal, there's atoms all over the place. It's, it's complicated. And the band structure also will look really complicated. So these are some real band structures from some materials. On the left is copper. Uh, and I'll explain what the Fermi level is in a minute. But the important thing to see is here, the Fermi level is, you can think of it like the highest filled level. And you can see that uh, one of the bands goes over the Fermi level. And that's what eventually we'll, we'll, we'll see is uh, what makes it a good conductor. But you can see there's lots of bands, and they overlap. And like I was talking about before, they start plotting it at the gamma point, which is the center of this reciprocal lattice, out to, in this case, the x point, or to the l point, in this case. And then here's the band structure of silicon and another semiconductor, gallium arsenide. And the difference between semiconductors, uh, you might see this term is whether it's a direct band gap semiconductor or indirect. And all that means is that the lowest uh, energy level here is offset uh, in reciprocal space from the highest energy level of the band below it. So you see that there's a, this distance here. Whereas in gallium arsenide, the lowest point is directly over the highest point. So we say this is a direct band gap semiconductor versus an indirect band gap. And that affects the way it absorbs light, for example, and how it interacts with uh, phonons and electrons as well. Okay, so there's one more piece we need to understand how band structure relates to transport, and that's the statistics of the carriers. So the band structure tells you the allowable states, but we also need to know what's the chance of actually finding something in that state. And to do that, you can go through uh, some statistical physics and arrive at this thing called the occupation function, which tells you at any given energy state what's the chance or not what's the chance, but how many particles do we expect to find. And this function depends on the kind of particle we're looking at. So for an electron or a hole, for example, the important thing is that they can't both occupy the same state. You can't have more than one. It's called the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, whereas for things like photons and phonons, you can have lots of them in the same state. And so that gives you these two different forms for uh, occupation functions. Uh, this would be for photons and phonons, and this would be for electrons and holes and other things as well. And uh, especially for electrons, there's this quantity mu here in the bottom of the exponential. And mu is called the chemical potential, or sometimes you'll see it called the Fermi level. Uh, and it's a little bit confusing. Physicists will call this the Fermi level at zero Kelvin, whereas electrical engineers will call this the Fermi level all the time. But uh, a way to think of this quantity mu is when there's no temperature at all, it's going to be the highest filled state of electrons. So mu is the, the top energy that's going to be filled in your material. And just to get a sense of what these distribution functions look like, we can plot them. So on the left, this is the uh, distribution for fermions. And you can see this is plotted. Uh, against this quantity E minus mu, or E minus the Fermi level. And we're plotting it at three different temperatures. So at low temperature, you have a very high probability of finding a particle below the Fermi level. And then above it is a very low probability. And then as you increase the temperature, this curve starts to broaden out. And uh, at very high temperature, you start to find many fewer over here and more over here. And uh, for the other distribution function, you see that at low temperature, the occupation function goes up to infinity. 
And a way to think of that is that all the particles can kind of collapse into one ground state. And there's no rule about them not sharing any state, so you can find uh, all of them in that state eventually at the lowest temperature. Okay, and then if we take this, this piece of information, the occupation function, and we multiply it by the density of states that we've talked about before, that gives you the real number of carriers. So you take the number of, uh, you take the available states, and you multiply by the chance of finding something in a state, and that gives you the real number of particles you'll find in that state. So now we're ready to talk about how this creates metals and semiconductors and insulators. And the main idea here is uh, you have two bands, and there's this Fermi level, or the highest field energy level. And when the two bands overlap, it means that there's really no, no gap, and then some of the electrons are free uh, to wander around inside the crystal. When there's a small gap, then you have uh, electrons only in this bottom region, in the lower band, and at zero Kelvin, there's no chance of finding them above this energy level. So they're all trapped in the bottom band. And then in an insulator, it's the same, except that this gap is much bigger. And uh, typically for a semiconductor, it will have this uh, three electron volt band gap, and then an insulator will have a much larger band gap. And to see what happens uh, as a function of temperature and what's the difference between, say, a semiconductor and an insulator, you can use this distribution function. So here at zero Kelvin, that plot we showed for the, the distribution function, the Fermi distribution function, is completely sharp. Let me go back for a second. So you can imagine this is at 100K. As you go to 0K, it becomes a step. So below the Fermi level, all the particles are there. And above it, there's none. Uh, so that's, that's shown here on the left. And in a conductor, you fill right up to the conduction band. In a semiconductor, everything's below. And in an insulator, everything's below. And then as you increase the temperature, this function tends to flatten out a little, or it tends to, to broaden out, rather. So you have a chance of finding some of the particles above the band gap in the semiconductor, because the gap is small. So as you heat it up, the material will become more conducting electrically and thermally as well. Whereas for the insulator, the gap is so big that even if you heat it up, you're not going to find a significant number of carriers up there uh, in the conduction band, and you won't be able to conduct electricity even at higher temperatures. And another way to look at this is uh, you, can, you can see the bands here. Uh, and on the left, we have a conductor. So here's the bottom band. Here's the next band up. And here's this Fermi energy, or the lowest field, or the, the highest field energy. And you can see that it's in the middle of a band. So that would be the conduction band in this case. And the one below it is the valence band. In an insulator, the bottom band is filled, and then there's this large gap between the next band. Uh, and so even if we heat it up, it's not going to be enough energy to get these electrons to jump up to here and be free to move around. And then a semiconductor is the special case, where the band is small. So at some temperature above zero, there's always some chance of finding a few electrons up in the conduction band. And the hotter you get, the more electrons you have, and the better a conductor it becomes. And the really nice thing about semiconductors and why they're so useful in a lot of applications is that you can move around this uh, highest energy level by something called doping. So you start with uh, a lattice of, say, silicon, and then you inject into it some lattice of another material that has extra electrons or a shortage of electrons. So they'll call them n-type and p-type materials, and they'll shoot in, say, phosphorus or arsenide or boron atoms. And when you do that, it will shift up this highest occupied level or shift it down. And what that will do is, is increase the concentration of free carriers in one region or decrease them in another. And that really forms the basis of how we make things like, like microcircuits, where you can add small amounts of doping in one level or another and modulate the properties. So that's really what's special about semiconductors. Uh, OK, so that's kind of like a top-down picture, top picture of what happens. You start with a big crystal, and you see how these bands emerge. Uh, there's another way to look at it that I'll just talk about briefly, which is kind of a bottom-up picture, where you start with 
uh, individual atoms with discrete energy states, and then you start putting them together. So we can consider really simply just a very simple atom with one orbital, like the s orbital, and you put it by itself, and it will have, say, one energy level. And then when you add a second atom uh, in a chain, you have two energy levels, and they're spread apart by some distance. And as you keep adding atoms to it, you get now three energy levels and four, and they keep splitting. And eventually, those will cover some finite range of energies as you add more and more. And the energies will get closer and closer together until pretty soon, they just fill in this whole space. And as you go to an infinite chain, they fill it out completely. And you have, within this space, no real discrete energy levels. They're so close together that it's effectively continuous, and you call it a band. And if you were to have, say, another orbital on top of this, so this is s, but if you had p, you would get a separate band above this or in a different spot. And as the atoms get more complicated and in different arrangements, you get different bands. And that's also a way you can look at how the band structure gets built up. So that's, that's more or less it. That should give you just some flavor of where these properties come from and how they're affected from the periodic nature of the, the crystal. If you want to learn more about this, uh, you can take a look at, at Gong Chen's book, Chapter 3, or a, an Intro Solid State Physics book. And they'll have whole chapters that will make this a lot more clear. So to finish up the lecture, I'm going to talk about a few examples where we can see practical manifestations of these properties. And the first one is what's called a, a single electron transistor. And uh, you may know how uh, transistors operate. As Aaron was saying, a transistor is a practical device where you can use an applied voltage to modulate the conductivity of a semiconducting material. So you can basically turn on and off an electrical signal by applying a voltage to a semiconductor and you can permit transport through it or uh, prohibit transport through it. Uh, and uh, this was studied a while back in the context of using, instead of a uh, you know, relatively large piece of semiconductor, using a nanoscale semiconductor as an island to accept electrons in a discrete fashion. And this diagram shows how the single electron transistor uh, operates. Uh, and what you have here is uh, uh, an island of insulating material, the gray material here. And uh, you have a single quantum dot between uh, these two electrodes, so what's called the source electrode and the drain electrode. And then we have a third electrode sitting up here called a gate electrode. And what can happen is uh, that uh, if you apply a voltage to this gate electrode, you can alter the allowable energy levels of the quantum dot. And because we know that the quantum dot has this discrete set of allowable energy levels, you can basically uh, create space to store one extra electron in the, uh, in the quantum dot itself. And what happens is as you then apply a second voltage difference between the source and the drain, you can store one electron at a time on this quantum dot and then let it tunnel across to the drain electrode and shuttle uh, discrete numbers of electrons across this island. So basically, you will see that you can store one extra electron at a time on this dot and then let it off. And when that one extra electron goes uh, off, you can let another one in. And the magnitude of the gate voltage that's applied determines the number of extra electrons that can be stored on this quantum dot island. And this can be a quantum dot particle, or it can be a wire, or it can be a very narrow piece of material. There, but uh, in the, the reading, uh, as you read it, you'll see that there are a couple of requirements based on the, uh, the uh, dimensions and characteristics of the, these materials for this system to work. And uh, this uh, quantum dot can be viewed as a small capacitor. And you can imagine the process of, uh, of, of storing an electron or you know, putting an electron on the island here as the process of adding one fundamental charge, one electron, to the capacitor. And based on the size of the dot, you could derive the capacitance of that dot and the energy difference or the energy needed to add one electron to that island. And in order for this to work 
in the correct fashion for you to be able to see this abrupt change in the conductivity of this device, you need that energy needed to add an electron to the quantum dot to be much larger than the thermal energy. So Aaron suggested that you know, as uh, temperature increases, the number of carriers that are thermally activated and kind of hanging out up in the excited state increases, and you need the energy difference required to add an electron to the dot to be much greater than the thermal energy for this to work in the prescribed fashion. And then you also need to have the right relative voltages to get the device to work properly. And so I've described already uh, what basically is happening down here, but down uh, uh, in the bottom pictures we see physically a diagram of the transfer process. So when uh, a voltage is applied to uh, basically overcome what's called the Coulomb blockade in the device, uh, you, uh, you reduce the uh, energy uh, structure of the quantum dot and basically create a space for an electron to tunnel across an applied voltage difference between the source and the drain. And then you store one electrode on the dot and then the electron tunnels across onto the drain and then the same process can repeat itself again over and over. And uh, on this plot, uh, we see uh, what is a representation of the physics of an ideal single electron device and in some ways certain devices may agree with this very well and what you see that the uh, separation between uh, the values of the gate voltage needed to store a different number of electrons with uh, uh, on the device are related to the fundamental charge of the electron E and, uh, and twice the capacitance of the dot. So that's the, that's the inherent intrinsic capacitance of it and this directly relates to the energy difference that's needed to place that electron from the source electrode onto the quantum dot itself. And so you can see that with equivalent increments in the gate voltage you can store one or two or three electrons versus time and, uh, and until you overcome that extra delta basically the extra difference in those energies required, you know, adding a bit more voltage does not increase the number of electrons that you've stored. And uh, for example, the dimensions of the device and the, different, the voltage difference between the source and drain electrodes will also determine the current. So for example, it can be determined by characterizing this device how many electrons you have on the dot at a time and also uh, what the current flowing through is. Because you may not know if you have a certain current going through, if that means you have one electron going uh, uh, through it at a time at say rate x or two electrons at a time going through at rate x over two. But uh, characterizing this can let you uh, figure that out. So then the second set of examples I want to talk about relate to the electronic properties of carbon nanotubes and here we're going to see a bit more physically how uh, this concept of chirality which we now know in a purely geometric sense relates to the electronic structure of the nanotubes and basically determines whether they're semiconducting or metallic or effectively zero gap semiconductors. So uh, as a recap, remember we saw that nanotubes are this conceptual rolling process of taking a, a graphene sheet or a single layer of graphite and uh, defining a unit cell and defining a waistband circumferential vector and then wrapping the uh, sheet around to form a seamless cylinder like so. And uh, we had to have this geometric continuity where you always connect one lattice point to the other lattice point in order to make a perfect or seamless nanotube. And uh, Aaron built this picture of uh, this one dimensional periodic potential uh, where you have you know, atoms or, or energy carriers at fixed points in a lattice and how that generally relates to the development of a band structure and a band gap in materials. So uh, I want to make a jump from that to now thinking of the process of closing a nanotube around its waist as forcing a periodic constraint on the wave function in the circumferential direction or around the circumference of the tube. And uh, just you know, b without the, the details beneath it, uh, develop a picture that we are uh, considering the circumference or the path around the nanotube in a similar fashion as we considered the width of our quantum well or the diameter of our quantum dot. And it turns out that by this sort of simple picture and by connecting the concept of the, uh, the lattice of the nanotube and the reciprocal lattice, which for our purposes is just a convention of you know, understanding how the wave functions and how the wave vectors are plotted, 
uh, there is a periodicity constraint that relates the diameter of the nanotube to the allowable values of the wave function around the nanotube and therefore lets us determine whether the nanotube is metallic or semiconducting. And this can be done in a kind of geometric sense based on the definition of the uh, reciprocal lattice vectors for the hexagonal lattice. So it turns out that you know, in, in the picture of the 3D crystal we saw, you have these different uh, reciprocal lattice directions uh, in the reciprocal lattice. You can do the same thing for a hexagonal sheet, and the reciprocal lattice looks just like the normal lattice, except you have the lattice points, or the so-called K points, at the center points of the hexagons in the real space. And if you plot the uh, circumferential vector uh, in the, on the reciprocal lattice, uh, and you enforce this condition of periodicity uh, on the reciprocal lattice where p is an integer, c is a, you have a constant 2 pi, you have the circumferential vector, and then you have the wave vector k uh, being in the direction parallel to c. Uh, if you have a, if you plot out the uh, allowable values of the wave vector and if they intersect with the k points of the reciprocal lattice, then it turns out that you have a, semi or a metallic tube, and if they don't intersect, you have a semiconducting tube. And physically, what this is doing is determining whether the valence band and the conduction band of the nanotube are touching or they are not. Basically, whether you have zero band gap and effectively a metallic tube, or you have a finite gap, band gap and you have a semiconducting tube. And based on this geometric picture, this, is, this relates directly to what we've read before, that if you have the difference between n and m uh, of the indices of the lattice being uh, 3p or 3 times multiple of an integer, you have a metal. And if this is not the case, you have a semiconductor. And you can see in these three cases, this geometric consideration is met for the 5,5 nanotube. It's met for the 7,1 nanotube. And it's not met for the 8,0 nanotube. And uh, also, I should note that the band gap of the nanotube is inversely proportional to its diameter, because as the, as the circumference gets bigger, uh, you become more like just planar graphite, which has zero band gap and is effectively metallic. So uh, because uh, like every, multi every large diameter nanotube also has a chirality, but in practice, because of the uh, relative uh, size of the band gap versus the thermal energy at room temperature, all carbon nanotubes, whether they are metallic or semiconducting based on their chirality, are metallic effectively at room temperature. So pretty, pretty much all multi wall nanotubes, which have sizes bigger than 3 nanometers or so, behave in a metallic fashion at room temperature, whereas single wall nanotubes that are typically smaller than that behave in a metallic fashion or a semiconducting fashion based on this uh, development of their band structure. And in practice, this is just a simplified picture of the, uh, the allowed states based on the magnitude of the wave vector and a two-dimensional picture of the band structure of graphite. And uh, in the case of a metallic tube, you see you have intersection between the valence band and the conduction band. And in the case of a semiconducting nanotube, there is a finite separation. And uh, this is uh, geometrically solved by the condition that we saw on the previous slide. And these in the reciprocal lattice space are the K points uh, 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 at which this overlap occurs. So uh, the, the reason behind this isn't so important, but I think this is a nice way where we can see a kind of elegant and simple relationship between the geometric constraint of the lattice and the development of the electronic structure. And you can imagine by changing the chirality or the lattice construction by just one atom, this constraint can be changed. And the, si the shape of these uh, bands is determined by the dispersion relations as something really beyond the scope. But there are also some special characteristics of nanotubes based on the dispersion relation being linear uh, uh, in the metallic case rather than being a parabolic. And returning to the chart of the this so-called periodic table of nanotubes, now we can see that based on the, this geometric constraint or the relative values of n and m, we have uh, tubes that are metallic. So here, uh, N and M are equal. And we also have tubes where here they're being defined as semi-metallic, but they're effectively metallic. And here, N minus M is a multiple of 3, or 3 times P. 
And then in all the other cases, that geometric condition is not met, and we have semiconducting tubes, and the band gap of these tubes uh, uh, differs and generally is larger for smaller diameter tubes, kind of like we saw for a quantum dot. The effective band gap of the structure is smaller and closer to the bulk band gap for uh, a larger diameter dot. And in the case of the nanotubes, the band gap is smaller and closer to the band gap of graphite, which is zero because graphite is effectively uh, a conductor uh, as the nanotube gets bigger and out of this real nanoscale size range. And now if we think of, you know, we, we, now we've now seen a, a kind of example of uh, quantum size effects in carbon nanotubes or effectively that the ability of single wall nanotubes to be semiconducting or be metallic is a manifestation of a quantum size effect. It's taking a material graphite which is uh, classically uh, a conductor and making it a semiconductor based on changing its size. And when we analyze the transport of nanotubes, we also see an example of a classical size effect. We see uh, an effect of the length of the nanotube on the resistance of it. So we've, we've said, you know, a nanotube can be semiconducting or it can be metallic, but we haven't really talked about what its electrical resistance is. And in this case, we have two regimes which we're going to call diffusive transport and ballistic transport. And we saw that these can apply generally to transport of heat or fluids uh, in the general energy carrier picture last time, and we'll, we'll see examples of those later on. But you know, now uh, I want to think about electrons, but keep the picture that this is a general picture of energy carriers. And first consider the case of diffusive transport, uh, or in the classical regime, where the length of our structure or the length of our nanotube is larger than the mean free path between collisions. So our carrier here, if it's one electron, can uh, go into the nanotube and it can hit, the, it'll, it's likely to hit the wall or collide with Know, uh, uh, with, with things in the lattice many times before it reaches the uh, output of the nanotube. And if you assume that there are relatively large number of collisions, then uh, we can say that the mean free path, or L sub e here, is much less than the length, and the resistance of the nanotube as a function of length is going to be directly proportional to its length. Or you know, uh, if we say R is a res the resistance per unit length, then the total resistance is just R times L. And you know, kind of like maybe going down a long a road and having many traffic lights, and maybe you're going to you know, meet your, some of the lights are going to be green and some of the lights are going to be red, and you have so many that you can say they have an average waiting time of, say, 15 seconds, then your total time to go down the road is just going to be the number of traffic lights n times the t uh, at each one, uh, you know, time, 15 seconds. Now, the picture is a bit different if uh, we have a case where the length of the carrier is, or the length of the channel or the length of the nanotube is very short, say smaller than the mean free path. In this case, the electron can go through the system without, effectively without any collisions. And you could say this is like you know, driving down a road with no traffic and no traffic lights, and you can essentially go as fast as you want. And it's not that there's no resistance here, but in this case, the resistance is uh, independent of the length and is equal to a fundamental quantity uh, which we won't talk about more, but is called the quantum resistance, or R sub Q. And this is related to Planck's constant H and the fundamental charge E, and also the number of conduction channels available in the material. So uh, the size, the diameter of the tube, or the size of the system uh, may determine the number of lanes or channels, if you will, in the system. And that determines the resistance of it. And this has been experimentally shown for single wall tubes and multi wall tubes and other materials. And for example, it's been shown quite beautifully that uh, in a multi wall tube, you have many conduction channels, and it's been the, the number of conduction channels available or the number of lanes for electrons to transport without collisions in the material has been related to the diameter and the other characteristics and basically measured the, uh, the, the current voltage characteristics of an individual tube and showed that this multi-channel ballistic transport theory applies and relates precisely to these constants and to the specific value of n. And then, so this more complete picture lets us understand or visualize the picture that we saw last time where these researchers fabricated devices where they had very long uh, single wall nanotubes strung between different electrodes. So these electrodes are just like pairs of fingers that let them measure the resistance 
uh, across this same single nanotube uh, uh, at different separations. So you can say uh, measure the, the voltage, you measure the uh, voltage current characteristics and therefore calculate the resistance uh, over, uh, across a small gap by you know, connecting your multimeter here to here, or you can measure it over a larger gap by connecting it along this long distance. And uh, what is seen is that the resistance of the nanotube depends both on uh, its length and depends on temperature. And the resistance is higher with temperature because you have more thermally activated carriers that scatter the electrons through the lattice. Uh, and at, rel at pretty much all temperatures, when the nanotube is very long, uh, on this log log plot, you have a linear relationship between resistance and length. So we are in the classical we are in we are in the regime of classical diffusive transport where the nanotube obeys uh, Ohm's law. And then the characteristic starts to change as you go down to a length where you see contributions from the combination of ballistic transport and diffusive transport, basically where the size of the system is affecting the number of collisions you have per unit length. And then we can see that at pretty low temperatures and also at short lengths, you have a case where the resistance is essentially independent of length and you are in the uh, quantum size regime or the regime of ballistic transport through the nanotube. And if you have just one conduction channel, that quantum resistance is a, f a value of about 25.8, I think. Is that right? 25.8 kilo ohms uh, for H divided by E squared. Uh, and, uh, and that would be uh, pretty much pretty close to what you see uh, here. And in practice, I think uh, at room temperature, people have made pretty high quality nanotubes and found ballistic transport across a length of about a micron. Uh, and uh, also, semiconducting nanotubes can behave ballistically if you apply enough gate voltage to uh, effectively decrease the band gap so you have uh, transport through the tube so it behaves like a metal. And there's been a lot of nice work on ballistic field effect transistors uh, using semiconducting nanotubes uh, as well. And uh, in addition to uh, making electronic devices using individual nanotubes, there is also work on making devices through large populations of nanotubes. And I'm just presenting this at this point to connect the idea that, you know, not only, not often, or not always do you have just one nanostructure in a device, but you have a large assembly of nanostructures, and we need to characterize the performance of that assembly as it relates to the characteristics of the individual structures and how they interact with their environment. So this is some recent work from uh, uh, Professor John Rogers' group at Illinois, uh, and we'll learn later how they make uh, these devices that consist of very well aligned arrays of parallel uh, single wall nanotubes. So they basically grow them on a substrate so they follow the same direction and then they connect them uh, in a, a device, a transistor, where you have a source electrode, a drain electrode connected by the nanotubes and you have a gate electrode that lets you effectively field dope the nanotubes so they, their electronic properties changes. And uh, as we'll learn later as well, uh, it's not possible to grow all the carbon nanotubes so they're metallic or all of them so they're semiconducting. So this little array contains some metallic nanotubes and some semiconducting nanotubes. And here they've plotted the diameter distribution. So you see they've tuned their growth process so, so you can grow a very large percentage uh, of nanotubes, say, between one half and two nanometers. So uh, if they're semiconducting, if they have, quote, semiconducting chiralities, they will have a band gap. And what they've done is this paper talks about the analysis of their devices as it relates to the resistance of the semiconducting nanotubes, the metallic nanotubes, and the contact resistances between the, uh, the metal contacts and the nanotubes themselves. And what they find is that they can effectively treat the paths through all the metallic nanotubes and all the semiconducting nanotubes as two parallel circuits, and that depending on the choice of metal they use to contact the nanotubes, and we'll learn about why this makes a difference uh, later on in the course, they can understand also the different contact resistances between the metal and the metallic nanotubes and the metal and the semiconducting nanotubes. And to just zoom in on a couple of terms here, these middle resistances uh, represent the intrinsic resistance of the nanotubes. And so here, the resistor representing the transport through the metallic tubes uh, is proportional to its length, LC, or the channel length here. 
divided by N sub M, the number of metallic tubes, and the average conductivity of a metallic tube here, sigma sub M with a bar over it. And uh, this suggests that in this case, we are in the diffusive regime. So the tubes are, as you can see from the your comparison to the previous work, uh, definitely longer than the ballistic transport length. And in the case of the semiconducting tubes, we have the same scaling with respect to the length and the number, but the conductivity of the semiconducting tube, sigma sub s, depends on the gate voltage, V sub g, or how much external potential is being applied to modulate the conductivity of the semiconducting tube. And these are the characteristics of the devices, which we won't get into now. But one of the major conclusions of this paper is because of how the electronic structure of the metal contacts they apply uh, interact with the electronic structure of the nanotubes, you have effectively much, uh, much uh, greater uh, transport when you have palladium as your contact metal versus gold as your contact metal. And this issue of what metals are useful for contacting different types of nanostructures is a very important one uh, that we'll learn about later as well. So now, as a last example, there's also interest in using nanotubes as interconnects. And uh, this is another example where, although we are in uh, the regime of diffusive transport, the electrical properties of nanotubes are thought to possibly be of interest for uh, meeting a very important problem in integrated circuit fabrication. So interconnects are more or less the wires that connect, that connect electrical signals in computer chips. So you have a whole bunch of transistors made out of different semiconductors. And to communicate the signals from transistor to transistor through individual layers and around, you know, up and down in the circuit, which has multi-layers, you use very small wires of copper. And as uh, the uh, size or the, the feature size of these circuits get smaller, uh, as our lithographic capabilities get smaller, then we need to make the copper lines smaller and smaller. And the uh, processes for making the copper and how that relates to the grain structure and the size of the copper become uh, limiting as you get down to uh, circuit scales, or in this case, is, this is referring to what's called the line width of about uh, 30 nanometers. So the line width basically means that's that number 30 nanometers corresponds to half the distance from one line or one circuit element to another. And because when you have, when lines of copper get down to this size, say tens of nanometers, they become composed of individual grains. And as you pass current through them, you can basically destroy the material and therefore that limits their current carrying capacity. And they also dissipate more heat and that leads to damage to the circuits. So more or less the idea is that because carbon nanotubes have greater, greater stability because they're much smaller channels that can handle electrons, and because they can carry higher amounts of current without breaking down, if you could integrate them in this high density fashion such that they're all very densely packed, you could make a material that would overcome these limitations to use of copper and interconnects. And so this is a, is, a, is a plot from a presentation by a scientist at Fujitsu. And Fujitsu makes a lot of electronic circuits. And then uh, and, and, and they've done a lot of, I, I feel, the most advanced research on nanotube interconnects. So what we're actually seeing here is what they're trying to plot is as, the, as time goes on, uh, basically will want to make smaller and smaller circuits. So they have a relationship here between the year and the size of the circuit. So s this number going smaller means smaller line width. And they say, for example, this was a couple years ago, in maybe about five years, we'll need to make interconnects that are smaller than the practical limit of using copper. And uh, basically, they're saying that the maximum current density of these copper interconnects is fixed at about uh, 10 uh, million amps per square centimeter. And uh, once we need a higher current density because we need to flow the same amount of current through a smaller line, uh, we will go into a regime where nanotubes are better than copper. So for that, they've been trying to develop processes that integrate nanotubes in, very, uh, in a very large and parallel fashion on their substrates. So for example, they'll use a, a, a chemical vapor deposition process using a plasma to grow carbon nanotubes over a full silicon wafer. And this is just an example of their logo grown over this wafer, but showing that they're able to get very uniform growth of nanotubes over these large area substrates. And another constraint is that in order to be compatible with the other materials used in integrated circuit fabrication, they need the growth temperature to be, uh, to be lower than typically used for growth of high quality nanotubes. So 
what they've been working on. And, 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 and another nice thing about uh, what, what, what they've done is they've, you know, for us, they've published a lot of their work, which is unusual for a lot of industries that do this, a lot of companies that do this kind of stuff. And so they've uh, tried to develop processes for localizing the growth of vertical bundles or vertical groupings of nanotubes between uh, two levels of electrical contact. So here they uh, use uh, a la catalyst layer of cobalt and titanium uh, upon a thin layer of tantalum, upon a thin but thicker layer of copper, uh, and they deposit those, and then they grow the nanotubes on these small areas of catalyst, and then they fill the whole area with uh, a silicon dioxide, and then they, then they polish that down, and then they put down a top contact, and they to characterize these by measuring the electrical resistance through this path like so. And what they're trying to do is control the growth process and the density of nanotubes and the quality of the nanotubes so hopefully eventually it, being, it can be as good as it is in copper. And they've made some really impressive progress, but they aren't uh, nearly there yet. And this, for example, shows a picture of the, the, the growth that they're able to obtain. So this is a few years old. I'm sure they're better now. But you can see uh, to make this ideally work, you really need a dense, straight organization of nanotubes. But at this point, they don't achieve this kind of little puffy, uh, puffy, puffy uh, set. And this is limiting because you don't have a high enough density in order to get that high conductivity by maximizing the density of tubes. And the quality of the individual tubes, meaning their defect density, is probably not good enough to also match the theoretical properties that are expected. So here they're showing, for example, the resistance. In this case, they're plotting the number of ohms per via, or you could say the number of, you know, the resistance of this whole path. Uh, uh, and uh, this is the value for copper, uh, which is about, uh, say, uh, uh, you know, 0.1 to 0 0.01 ohms per via. And uh, this is the results they've obtained with nanotubes. So they suggest that by eventually being able to grow nanotubes at a very high density, they could eventually match the conformance of copper. But over a long time of research, they've been able to increase the characteristics of their nanotubes so they get lower, so the resistance gets lower and lower by improving their quality and by also uh, increasing their density so they can fit down to this place. But they are not quite where they need to be. And so another uh, uh, interesting thing to me is here they're talking about the same process where they're using these cobalt nanoparticles uh, and growing them. And as you can see, when you have a growth temperature of 450 C, the resistance is somewhat higher than a growth temperature of 510 C. It's actually quite a substantial difference, a factor of a few, because it's a log plot. And a higher growth temperature means you grow nanotubes with lower defects. And if you grow nanotubes with fewer uh, defects, a lower defect density, then their electrical conductivity is higher because you have less scattering due to defects and due to flaws in the walls uh, due to this diffusive transport. So there is a direct relation here between the characteristics of you know, nanotube transport in that diffusive regime and their electrical properties. And so this is one of, for me, it's sort of one of the, the biggest manufacturing challenges and examples where nanotubes could make a practical difference. And here we're only talking about uh, metallic nanotubes. They're typically multi-walled or they're metallic single wall nanotubes. And we're talking about something out of the quantum size regime, but where uh, deal, dealing with the you know, high electrical conductivity we would achieve if we pack nanotubes densely and we got them uh, to have very, very high quality. And there's still a long way to go in terms of understanding how to control the growth process and also how to couple the growth process with all the other manufacturing methods, which is really one of the big challenges to integrating uh, nanotubes in devices like circuits. You can certainly grow better nanotubes if you grow them on their own, but you can't grow them so well if you can find the growth to these small holes and you, uh, uh, and you try to decrease the growth temperature so it's compatible with about the 500 C limit that exists for the other materials that are needed to use to make the chip. Okay, so that's the end of today's lecture, and uh, Wednesday we'll talk about mechanical properties. Are there any questions before we go?